All right. Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today, our speaker is Dr. Doug Lindy, um, Professor of Turf Management. He's going to be talking to us about converting a lecture into an experiential learning activity. So, Doug, I'll get, hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for showing up, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to share this information. This is a presentation I gave last year at the Faculty of the Future Conference at uh, Bucks County Community College. And uh, this is actually a pretty good conference. I've attended quite a few years and I've learned quite a few things. And mainly I've learned a lot of online teaching things. Not that I used them, but there was always presentations on them. And now uh, with our current situation, it's something that um, I got to remember, hey, what were they doing? All those crazy things, I, I thought they were crazy. And now they're like, we need to do those things. But um, so uh, this is was a presentation from last year and it was before the pandemic, so it was kind of geared towards face-to-face uh, -face learning. And one thing that I'm just thinking of this morning is what if, you know, how do we do this in online learning situations? So near the end, we'll have a little discussion on how to maybe think about that approach. So um, do you see this in your lectures at all? All right, uh, wanna learn a way to see this. And this is, again, this is before pandemic. Look how close they're sitting. And you never thought of that uh, as odd, but, um, Anyway, you can see they're all very well engaged and it's not necessarily experiential learning, but you don't want to be that kind of professor where they're looking at you paying attention. So here's the topic, converting a lecture into an experiential learning activity. And I just put this this morning um, for face to face. That's what this presentation is. And in the end, um, I'm going to we'll have a little discussion about how would you do this for an online content or online instruction. So back in uh, spring of 2019, I taught a new class called Pesticides for the Green Industry. And um, we decided not to offer a lab just because of the content, there wasn't enough to do labs, even though we could do some lab-like things. So I said to, to Dr. Ricotta, like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do some lab things in the lecture. Okay, so that, that's kind of where I started thinking this, uh, how could I uh, you know, not just have PowerPoints and convert convert some of my topics into experiential learning so the students are more engaged. And as you know, Delval, we're supposed to be great at this. So like, okay, I better figure this out even better. Um, so hopefully this can help you, uh, inspire you, maybe do your job better, or even just start thinking differently about your lectures. Uh, so here's the outline, right? And we're gonna go through some of these pretty quick because most of us at Delval should know these things. Uh, and then uh, have two breakout sessions near the end where it's pretty much the discussions. Um, at the Faculty Future Conference, we had people work together. Uh, here, it's a little bit trickier. We'll just have a discussion on Zoom. So uh, my credibility, I'm not gonna go through this line by line, but you can just see, like all of us, we teach a lot of different classes and um, you know, advise students. So that's a pretty typical profile of a DelVal prof. Uh, next topic is what's an experiential learning activity? Right, what is that? Fancy words. Uh, here's some definitions. And uh, I'm not sure where I got the definitions, but they're pretty standard. And EXL is what I'm going to use throughout the, pr the presentation so you understand what I'm referring to. And I've, I kind of put this as learning through experience, more specifically learning through reflection on doing. So the student does something and says, wow, that worked or didn't work, or, or they learned something from that, right? Applied learning is where they really almost know the information. Okay, um, Dr. Langston talked about this chemistry thing, and then um, I went out and did something with it in lab, and it kind of reinforced it, or you learned it that way. So to, to, that could be almost similar, but I think there is a difference between the two. The experiential is kind of having the experience first, and it just kind of, um, they, they stumble upon, in a way, of what you want them to learn. Then you got these other terms, which you could argue they're all about the same, but they're, you know, probably an education expert's gonna argue that they're all different. Um, but pretty much, these are doing things and learning something from them. Uh, let's see. Uh, Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I have there, I can't, uh, up in the upper right, it says EXL is best for physical skills. It's pretty easy. You can see all these pictures, right? Learn by doing. 
right? What about this? Is this, you don't have to respond to this, but is this EXL, right? We got a professional doing something in front of our students. It's not, right? They're just standing there watching, right? What about this, right? My students are on our putting green, do core aeration and cleaning up. Yeah, that's EXL. Um, also, it might be uh, free labor, but uh, in a way, they don't mind doing some of that. Uh, what about this, putting together a bicycle with instructions? Yeah, that's definitely EXL, right? And our students and millennial students be before them, they like to do it without the instructions, right? They'll just jump and try to figure it out that way. Uh, what about this? This is one of our profs, Sal. Uh, he teaches small engines, right? Is that, is that EXL? Right, and I'm not sure, it's just a picture, but if the prof is just showing and doing everything, like, hey, watch, this is how I started, this is how I changed the oil, then that's not. It's just watching a, a 3D lecture, <laughs> to put it that way. Uh, but if he's saying, okay, now, John, uh, take the stick out, and this is pull the cord, then that's EXL. Uh, what are some of the strengths? Right, these are our classic selling points. It's exciting. There's anticipation for the student. There's lots of unknowns like, hey, we're going on this trip. Uh, what's doctor, what are we gonna do? Uh, students get to interact with the skill or concept, right? They're not just sitting there and uh, you, uh, you know, reading through your PowerPoints. And then uh, often it provides feedback on what's working and what's not. So. If you go back to putting the bicycle together, you got the wrong screw and you can't get it in. So you got to look in the bag, hey, where's the other screw for that? So they learn something, right? That that screw wasn't the correct screw. So that's, that's EXL. Uh, there are some challenges which you need to be aware of. And um, first is how to measure learning. So an education purist is, always wants to measure every activity for learning, right? Some skills, just take too much time to assess each student separately. I'll give you an example. I teach how to calibrate a sprayer. We do it outdoors, and uh, they're usually up to eight to 12 students. Okay, so it's a demonstration, and I get some of the students to interact where we can. But I can't measure that. That I, If I decided to do, okay, each student, I want you to calibrate the sprayer on your own. Right, it's probably gonna take me 10 minutes per student, right, 10 minutes times how many students, so now it becomes more, more challenging to, to pull that off. Uh, two, it can be difficult to control what's learned, right? So this is an example, um, we go on a field trip, right? We're experiencing a golf course and everyone's gonna learn something different, remember something different, uh, but that's okay, right? It's, it's um, but if you're trying to get them all to learn the same thing, then you gotta focus more, make sure you, you, you emphasize those points while you're going through the experience. Uh, three can be difficult to meet learning objectives of the course, right? Well, that's our job is to make sure they meet them, but it can be more challenging. Like um, if I say something like, I want them to learn how to calibrate a sprayer and I never assess that, then how do I know they met the learning outcome, right? So um, anyway, it can be a little bit more challenging. Uh, you can have more logistics, more resources potentially, depending what you do, less time to cover the course content, Right, that's one, think about that. Um, and that really is like, okay, if I do this activity with the sprayer, wow, that's gonna take a lot of time. I can't get through chapter eight or nine probably. So wow, that's gonna be a, uh, so that's something that you may have to let go of. And by attending the Faculty of the Future Conference for a few years, a lot of the prep profs were saying that, don't worry about, a lot of the speakers were kind of saying like, don't worry about getting through all the content. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And it kind of started to rub off on me a little bit. So, and then there's some others, and I'm sure there is. And this is where if we were in a discussion group, we, we could, actually, let's stop here. If you could, if you, any, if any of the participants have any other challenges that you may think of, you want to unmute and tell us, that'd be great. Okay, no one does. Okay. Wait, wait, Doug, wait. Okay, wait. all right, Cynthia. Sorry, it took me long to unmute. <laughs> um, probably one of the challenges is getting the students also to commit to being actively involved. Correct. Right? Correct. Yep. So. Correct. Anyway. Yeah, and some of that can come down on us on 
Uh, and I can see myself uh, out, out doing a project outdoors, which I do a lot. There'll be the a handful of students who are going to step forward always, and then there'll be the others who are in the background. And as you know, um, most you know most props try to I, I try to make you know encourage them without making embarrassed. Like, hey, Melissa, come on, now it's your turn. Why don't you try it? And then if I don't make them, don't don't bully them or anything like that. Just try to egg them on just a little bit to to get going. No, so, yeah, it's true. Well, and especially in a large class. Correct. Correct. Uh, anyway. Yep. So that, which, which reminds me, I'm kind of focusing on this presentation is on a lecture, right? And I, I know I teach a lot of lab things and I might talk about that, but really I'm in the lecture and the lecture period. How can I make that during that time period a little more EXL-like? All right, so the next topic is why convert? Why, why do this, right? And you, you, you probably know a lot of this already. These are just some generalizations. The population we're dealing with, um, our common student, they prefer learning by doing, right? They almost never read directions, love to learn by interacting, uh, find traditional lectures boring, right? And you know, what's a traditional lecture? Probably um, you know, writing on the board where they have to take notes, and now probably PowerPoint where you read from the slide the whole whole like whole time period i think they don't like that <laughs> so uh, and that's a challenge for us because that's is a method that we use a lot and it provides a lot of interactivity and feedback for what what does and doesn't work so um, those are some of the, the the not challenges some of the characteristics of the of our generations that we're teaching here's some examples just run through some of these uh, these are general categories of things you can do in the lecture period. Um, role playing, discussion scenarios, a class project, uh, class experiences, it's, that could mean a lot of different things. And field trips, we'll say, well, it's, it's lecture. How can I do a field trip in lecture? Well, you can. You can um, walk outside, right? And they say, well, how can I do that for math? How can I do that? Well, you, you got to dig down deep for your area and, and somehow do something a little bit different. Um, and uh, make it a type of experience. So here's one I did in a lecture of my uh, pesticides class. I put this scenario up there to get them thinking, right? The tank is full, this is a sprayer, right? And these nozzles are the things that where the spray comes out, spray, uh, where the spray comes out and they're all clogged up immediately. So they, tank, they put the materials in the tank and there was a, 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 a chemis, chemical reaction that made it precipitate and it clogged all the nozzles and it's kind of a really difficult situation. So um, I just had them think about that and have, we had a little discussion and come up with some answers. A class projects for me, because I have a lot of hands-on learners and things we can do, um, this is pretty easy to do. It can, this can be a lecture and you just go outside, go somewhere in the, in the 75 minutes or 50 minutes and have them do something. So this was easy because the class I only had uh, on that day it looks like only four students showed up, so that was pretty easy. I said, "Okay, you put together my new spreader." All right. Uh, then uh, in my speech classes, when I've taught it, I had the students uh, do speeches, pretty much experiential learning at its best. Right? Okay, Melissa, get up in front. You're going to talk, and I tried to do only two minutes of speaking, and then I would give them coaching. I said, "Okay." Um, all right, Melissa, now let's go through it again. Try it again. This time, take your hands out of your pocket or stop chewing your gum. And then, and then I did some tongue twisters to help them pronunciate. Um, here's a project I always do in one of my turf classes. They have to grow grass in pots, and this is during the spring semester, so they start this in the winter. And for some reason, um, it was a very simple thing to do, and they have to do it uh, on their own time, like as homework for seven weeks and come back and report to the class what happened. And uh, I do grade this one, right? To get, they have to give a short oral report. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was, was just thinking, uh, if you're studying turf, you gotta be able to prove to me you can grow grass. <laughs> so, so here's a, for their first chance to prove that. And then I, on a related, this would be a fall, one of my fall turf classes, I make them go outside and they have to take ownership of an area, and you can see by the pictures, and they have to grow some grass. They come up with whatever treatments they want to do, and then they have to um, 
grow it. So they usually take a pretty good interest in watching how their grass grows. I know that seems odd, but uh, you know, but for us, that's what we do. And uh, and a lot of my students love doing this kind of labor, so it just connects them to the subject a little bit better. This is a project that we've done in soils class, and we take the students down to Gemmel Farm. They work in groups doing soil testing, and uh, be, previously we would do this on the Del Val. Uh, we call it main campus. We would just walk, and uh, because we were trying to use Gemmel, so we decided to you know hire the bus, take the students down, and the logistics after a while became challenging, right? And now we moved it back. I think last year we moved it back to campus, where we just walk out to the field. So, uh, so they're still getting the same experience, except not having to ride the bus, and and now we don't have to pay. Uh, the uh, the company to do that so that was another reason as well uh, here's uh, I think there's only a few more EXL projects now this this was a lab project right and I guess maybe it shouldn't be here but I just want to show you some of the things we had uh, it could be done in a lecture have a guest speaker come in and have them do something with a professional so we re uh, um, we had the class re uh, we see re redesigned the sprinklers around our campus putting green and we had in three in industry professionals that people that do it for a living they came in and ran the whole lab right and i was just a picture taker and making sure they had their drinks and that kind of thing um, so uh, that was uh, i had to actually combine the lab with the lecture because they were we were going too long like we needed that extra time so and Happens to be that that event I didn't grade. A lot of these I'm not grading, and you might be critical of me. Of, hey, why don't you grade that? Um, it's just difficult. To, I, I'm not. It, you know, they are, they're having good experiences like this, and for me to attach a grade, I have to come up with some really strange grading method uh, to do that. And then this is a, a lab as well. This is EXL in groups where they're working together, doing some land surveying. And as I said before, if you have are teaching a skill that is a, a yeah, skill or a concept that's physical, it's pretty easy to do. The challenge is, is logistics. But again, you can take your lecture, get outside, move somewhere, or do something, bring bring the materials in into the class and have them do it. Now, this next category is class experiences. This covers a lot of things that are really not lab related, but um uh, this was a, a local turf breeder uh, up in Plumsteadville. Invited boys, invited the class up to help him do some seeding. He was kind of looking for some free labor, so we would go up for only about an hour, and um, and then we had to drive back for the next class. But the students liked it, and he got free labor. They got to uh, rub elbows with professionals in the industry. Uh, and then I had an etiquette dinner. This is again, uh, this is a, a lecture class only, case study. So I invited some alums to come in and <clears throat> kind of my, uh, not, not a cruel experiment, but I had the dining hall teach dining etiquette while um, um, we're, you can see the picture there to my students. And then the students, then we had professionals, right? And mostly my alums sitting in there, they had to interact. And then after a while, after a few years, I decided to have a cocktail hour beforehand to force them to mingle with the professionals. And that was a great little experience. And um, to see them, it, it, you know, how do I ask questions and, and, um, and, and that kind of thing. But I never graded the event. They always loved the event. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure I probably could get a grade out there somehow. I don't know. How, I, I don't, didn't really want to be grading their etiquette. But technically, you, you could if you wanted to do that. Uh, this is a lab kind of thing, uh, but um, I took the class to a, a golf tournament where they prepare the course for a, this is a local golf tournament, and the students got a chance to do. Here they are. Here uh, I made them get up at 3:30 a.m. So we got back for classes the next their next class. But um, these kind of experiences, if you can, if you can do them. Right, they they remember that forever. They never remember my powerpoints or any information, but they remember getting up at three thirty. And um, so I think that's still pretty good. One of the the goals of EXL is is memories, right? They're going to reflect back on having a good experience. 
attending a, a greens committee meeting. This was a, a lecture class that I got them. We took a field trip during the lecture. Actually, we had to go in the evening, uh, agree on a time in the evening and go to a golf course and sit in on their greens committee meeting. This is a committee that oversees the maintenance of the course. They're all their members, like group of five members. So we had them do that. Again, I didn't grade it and um, probably should have. Um, <clears throat> measuring putting green speed, this is a, something that we do talk about a lot. And so um, it's, it's best to have them go out and do it, right? And then uh, a case study, I took the students to a friend's lawn nearby. Doylestown was having all kinds of problems. So we had to go out and diagnose it. Again, I didn't grade that one. I think there's one or two more here. Another a project in my case studies course is we went to this golf course, and this one was was a self graded, right? They had to um, uh, develop a presentation on how to fix the situation there, and uh, come up with some solutions, and then defend it, and then they would self grade themselves. This is a project in a weed science lecture. We went to Home Depot. Right, just it took us only uh, just about an hour to get down and back, and they had to go in the Home Depot and find, uh, pick a, uh, let's for example, pick a weed, right, uh, crabgrass and turf, for example, and go in Home Depot and find three ways to control crabgrass and turf. So, right, those are some class experiences. Now, field trips, these, these are typically not something you can do in a lecture. Right, you need that extra time, uh, but I, I put it in here because I think it's something to think about. Um, our field trips, EXL, right? You're on a trip to a farm, and you're just sitting there watching everything. So is that any different than sitting in lecture and watching a video? Uh, it, it is different when they can see and smell and experience things. I think it is, uh, but you could argue that maybe field trips are too passive. Right, they're not experiential learning, so I'm not going to get into that argument. But um, but these can be difficult for large classes, as you know. Uh, students love them, and uh, anytime I take a trip, the students in the evaluations they love the field trips. And I said that the, said to Jackie Ricotta, it's like I should just make all my la all my labs field trips. I said, well, then maybe they're not going to learn any skills. Uh, but it's to, to me, it's still something if the customer really is learning and engaged, that's got to be a good thing. We got to tap into that somehow the best that we can. And how do you measure learning on a trip? Right, this could be just the trip walking across campus. Uh, this is something that I didn't develop, I just learned from Faculty of the Future. You have a field trip report, right? Have them uh, just some basic things, not too long, so you're not killing yourself with work. But uh, just I tended to like the question three, uh, list two unanswered, unanswered questions you have for after the activity, that you have after the activity. So, um, and again, this is right from faculty of future, someone's speaker, someone spoke doing the same thing. I just kind of uh, used it. And it turns out that question three results in a lot of good discussion the next lecture. So. After the trip, the next class we meet, I would use those unanswered questions to spark a more discussion. Uh, visit a professional baseball field. We went to a golf course, um, you know, get, go out in there doing things. And uh, most of my students are hand, such hands-on learners, right? So here they're on a field trip, just standing there looking at stuff. And it is just different because you got uh, Ken Button here, the owner of Lawn Depot, uh, doing the speaking. Right, not Doc Lindy. So it just makes it, he says the same things that I say, but it just, I don't know, it creates a, a stronger memory for them. Um, and uh, so these are things that if you can do, right, have experiences, field trips, right, do, do them the best that you can. Uh, this is a trip, I do this with my Longwood summer class. We go to a local sod farm, and it's a graduate of mine, and he cuts some sod with that machine. And then we usually load a few rolls onto the truck and then come back an hour later and we lay the sod. So we kind of put this whole thing together from cutting the grass all the way down to laying the grass. Okay, so um, those are a lot of examples from my world and it would be great to, to have lots of time we can learn from each one of you. Uh, but I think it's important to, to just think about in your world, your content, what can you do? Uh, and I'm gonna, move to the next 
topic, which is how to convert a lecture right into an EXL activity. All right, so first is how much do I need to convert, right? So I would say uh, first you could just do one lecture topic, right? And it could be, you know, uh, how to milk a cow. I see Bruce is there, how to milk a cow. That's probably more than one lecture topic. Um, or maybe one lecture class, right? This whole class, I'm gonna do an activity. Uh, or maybe you can convert some lecture classes, right? Or all lecture classes. What if you didn't do any more PowerPoints every lecture right you're going to have let's say 30 lectures you're going to do something with an experience and uh, back in the future we're always talking about flipping the classroom right get them to read the book at home and then when they come they have an experience so uh, that conference is kind of wearing me down and I, I i started trying some of these things i haven't got to the last bullet there yet i'm not sure if i ever could uh, but uh, i'm starting to work my way through so for you uh, with your lectures, just try this one first. I do one topic, right? And uh, maybe we ought to get rid of the word lecture even, right? So today I, I have a lecture and then have a lab. Well, maybe they, they don't need to be called lectures. Maybe they should be called something else. I think I have here like a, a learning time or, or, or something else um, because lecture can sometimes be, have a connotation to it that's boring. Right, so here's some just some ways on how to convert a lecture. And uh, number one, and I said this earlier, <clears throat> let go and don't worry about presenting all the content. Right, that was hard for me to do because they got to know this about turf disease. They got to get through all the diseases. I got to, otherwise they won't know it. So again, faculty of the future, those those teachers, those speakers kept wearing me down. Like, okay, I okay, I'm just gonna let go of that. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where I, and I challenge you to do that as well, uh, to let go of them, get you getting through the information. Uh, two, pick a part of the content that you can create an activity. So you got to think about a topic and is there you know, any way I can do some kind of activity in this topic? And ideally, it'd be nice if it was connected to a learning outcome. And then do some brainstorming with yourself or other people, uh, and then you just give one, give one a try, okay? And then after you do it, of course, you look back and say, did it work? Right, here's one for the pesticides of the green industry. Uh, let's see, one of my outcomes there is number six. Select, this is at the end of the course, the students should be able to select an appropriate pesticide for a pesticide. Right, that's something in real, real world they would need to do. So I wanna take them through that skill. So here's number six. And in the class, I have a lot of different majors. And they're all from different plant industries. Like we got turf, we got horticulture, and, and crop science. And each of them are specialists in their own little crop. And they don't need me up there telling them, okay, here's for corn, here's all your, here are the pests you're gonna see and go through all those. I don't have time for that, nor am I an expert in all of that either. So um, I decided to kind of try this experiential learning activity and uh, get them to learn the process and not, worry so much about the content or the actual results. So here's, here's what I do. I put this up on the screen. I have students, I tell them, uh, next lecture, bring in your laptops, right? And I put this up on the screen and I say, we're gonna work in groups. So work, form a group with people of your like crop. So all the turf students work together in crop science. And then I want you to go through this list and pick the crops, at least three that you wanna do. Okay, and they're, they're gonna do the crops they're familiar with. And then find two pesticides for this situation. So number one would be a potato leaf hopper and soybeans. So if they're a crop science students, hey, we're gonna do that one. And then down below, there's three resources. They need to go through one of these and it's gonna just list, okay, for that situation, you're gonna use these different pesticides. So this is exactly what farmers do. Um, and I was just trying to get them to experience the same thing. So how did it go? And there you can see in yellow, um, yeah, the, the students, I wanted them to work together in the same major. Um, I didn't know, always know their, their answers if they were correct or not, because I don't know crop science. So I just was watching over to see if they're using the, the resource. And it really didn't matter the actual answer. And uh, they were engaged. Um, how did I measure learning? I, I didn't uh, in that situation. Uh, but I, you know, I'm just trying to get through this scenario and probably as I do it more than once, 
over the years, I probably should start to measure learning somehow, but they did learn things. Uh, the second one, and I'm gonna probably uh, cruise through this one pretty quick, is there's an outcome, and this is a pretty difficult outcome to measure, and maybe I should change it, is explain the social, economic, and environmental issues with pesticides, right? That's, how do I measure that? So like, oh, maybe I, I should change that in the future. Uh, but here was my attempt to get them engaged with these concepts, at least. Um, and there's many issues with, with, with many different opinions, and there's lots of controversy around the issues, as with anything like this. And so what I decided to do is just share a consulting job that I did, and I, I turned it into a role play. And it's with the retirement community, and half the community are against pesticides, and half are for. And so I decided to make a role play. And I had a town hall meeting right right during the lecture. And um, I had a student that volunteered to be each one of these re uh, people, okay? And then I had uh, groups of students that were residents in favor of using them and then residents against. And what I, dis what, did I, what I had, I kind of spoke to each group, especially the ones against pesticides that to be, um, you know, um, cause a little ruckus, cause a little, uh, little stress, like yell, yelling things out like you would have a town hall meeting. Um, so uh, and it turned out that uh, students seemed to, to love it. Uh, one student was the grounds manager who was getting criticized a lot. I was the moderator to try to con control things. And uh, they, they, there was lots of laughs, even though we were trying to be serious, there were still lots of laughs. And I think they really not only enjoyed the experience, but got something out of it because we ended up having good discussions from it. So, um, so it was kind of fun creating the hostility like there would be in a, in a real world situation. So that's just something for them to experience the, these, those difficult economic social issues. We just took them into this situation. So, all right, so now that's pretty much, I'm gonna stop speaking just for, for a little bit here. And we're gonna get into a discussion and let me bring up the people again here. Okay. and. Uh, well, it may not be a discussion, but let's uh, by yourself pick a course that you teach and list at least five topics you present with traditional lecturing. All right, let me see here. Okay. Yep. So, uh, you know, just think of a class that you teach and focus on one class. List list five topics that you present present in a lecture. And then I'm going to ask just for some examples. So when you're ready, if you want to give me a topic or two from your area, just unmute yourself and say, you know, how to milk a cow or whatever. I have my summer syllabus right here, which I can just. There you go. Good from. work. <laughs> I'll just pick the first two, okay? Sure. Microscopes and staining, prokaryotic cell structure. Yeah, correct. Good. Okay. Do you want more from me? No, I'll just, just oh. <laughs> wait a few more minutes, wait, okay. wait a few more seconds, see if anyone else is inspired. I was thinking uh, about analytical chemistry one um, and I, 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 in my head, I started to just think about what's at the top of the syllabus, <laughs> typically for topics. So I did a gravimetric analysis and spectrophotometry. Correct. So you're in the lecture, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're doing, if you're, I guess if you're doing a spectra, uh, yeah, the second one mm -hmm. in lab, the lecture is a nice place to get warmed up for that. And yeah. And that typically is what happens that the way we've had analytical set up is that they have like that, you know, the hour and 20 minute block of lecture, but then it rolls right into lab. Okay, great. So I finish lecture and then we go right over to lab. Um, right. So, so been, I know this is getting ahead a little bit, but there's been times where I've done the opposite, where I've said, okay, we're going to do a little lab and at the end, throw in some lecture. But, so you kind of surprise them with the method up front without. Get all the prep, and then in the end, you can clean. That's a good way to. I think that 
the Gen Zs, our students might appreciate that because they seem to be like to jump in right away. Yeah. But for yeah. us, it's going to look messy because like, hey, you're not doing the right technique. And mm -hmm. but, you know, it's a lab, I guess. Yeah, we take their learning style and, and have as a learning experience. Yeah. As long as they're not blowing yeah. things up or <laughs> so. I, I typically try not to do that. <laughs> Um, okay, well, the idea on this this discussion was if we're all if we were together, you would work in a group with you know or um, come up with a few things and these I would even look at the more difficult subjects that you know the students struggle with, and can you get you know get that topic and challenge yourself to try to find an EXL? so let's I'm gonna if we're okay to continue on, mm -hmm. okay, let me get rid of let me do that. Um, uh, this was kind of the second part of that, and we kind of did that with one or two neighbors, uh, do it by yourself because of Zoom. Uh, brainstorm for activities for that topic, right? So this would be nice in, in, at the Faculty of the Future, you had people from different areas, and uh, they, they don't know what color metric that was, so they would just ask questions and, and that interaction could possibly come up with some other ideas, right? So this is the, 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 the strength of this whole presentation is people working together to get, get other ideas. And because we're of our constraints, it's a little more challenging to do that. Uh, but I guess my point is if you can't be together, maybe you have a colleague in chemistry that you could email or biology, like, hey, how would you, um, you know, give me some ideas on how you could do this or, or do that. And uh, even without, even, you know, outside of Del Val, some colleagues you might want to interact with. Uh, and then your topic, right, and the activity. So this is, this is, you may have come up with a topic, okay, that you're going to try an activity with and have two or three brainstormed ideas that you might try. And then, um, you know, pick one, right? And then, um, you know, obviously one and two here are important. Is it going to be tied to the outcome, right? Are, and are, are you going to measure learning? And if so, how? And my gut feeling is I, I don't, if you, if, you, if, you, um, if you saw earlier, I don't measure learning right away because I'm trying to just get through the activity to see if it's any good. And uh, I can survive and the students survive. Uh, but here are some ways to measure learning after an EXL activity. These aren't my ideas. These are just what I've learned. Um, you can have an exam or a quiz, right? And um, you, know, you can have post activity. And exams or quizzes are kind of difficult because uh, EXL, you can't control what they learn, so that's why it's kind of hard. Okay, let's have a quiz, and uh, and it's less sub it's a subjective kind of uh, topic, and it's hard to do more more challenging. But you could uh, post activity discussions. I have most of I have a lot of that, right? Um, you know, you could grade those or not. Uh, have participation points. But those those are great, right? As soon as you can, like after an activity on the if I'm in a van or in the class or the next class, we have a discussion. Hey, what went right? What went wrong? Um, a one minute paper. That's just something you have the whole entire class in one minute write down some things they learned or uh, um, just, you know only two sentences or so. Because so, then you got to read all those uh, again. It's not a graded activity. You could you know I guess you could make it graded. Uh, reflection questions. These are what I've done for after field trips. Right, list three new things you learned. Two unanswered questions that you have from the activity, and that last one is pretty powerful, giving you discussion questions you can use. But also, uh, maybe that you've missed the mark with the activity, and nobody's learned something that you wanted them to learn through it. Um, and then, lastly, is this something? Uh, does learning always have to be measured? And that could be a topic in itself, a discussion topic. And you can see, I don't always measure it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we could argue, well, that's not a good thing. Uh, but I kind of use EXL a lot as uh, having a good experience. The student feels possibly inspired by the content. And maybe that's going to inspire him or her to read the, read the textbook a little bit more or study e even better. So um, we're almost near the end. The second breakout session would be that uh, working with one or two neighbors, right? In this situation, you'll do it by yourself. Uh, where you develop a learning outcome for each activity, right? So you got this topic, and let's say you had three 
brainstorm for three activities, right? Start developing them. How would I make this work, right? And are you going to measure learning, okay? And then um, eventually what you'll do is pick one that you're going to try in your class for this fall, right? And then just, uh, you know, evaluate if it works. So this is kind of baby steps and to try to get you to try something different if you haven't done things like this. Um, and the ultimate would be to take your most boring topic, at least that what you think that students hate to hear, and try to do, do some type of EXL around it and just to see what happens. Uh, but I put an X there because we're not going to do that. I think I, we, I need to, I, I, don't know, I was kind of wanting to hear from the audience on how would you do EXL in an online instruction? So uh, this is the official ending of uh, this presentation of my part. And if, if um, anyone's interested in discussing this, right, I would be because uh, from what I've been reading, uh, going back to the semester in the fall, the other universities are kind of asking faculty to be prepared to do online and in person or both together at the same time. If you have a few students that have to be isolated, Right, how are we going to keep educating them, and but also coming in face to face? So I'd be interested to hear anything like, how do you do EXL in online instruction? So if anyone has any ideas, I'd love to hear. So I'm teaching micro, right? This summer session one, so I had to come up with some things, and you know, since they can't really um, be in the lab, right. I had them. We talked about media. And I had them make, I sent them sterile petri dishes, and I had them make media from a recipe I gave them, but then I had them, they had to come up with their own recipe and make the media and see if they could grow bacteria on that. There were some creative ideas. Someone used miracle Grow nice. and auger, right? And so someone used peanut butter, another person used chicken broth and things like that. But so that's a little simple thing, but I tied it in with a um, book that was a microbiology home bacteriology correspondence course from 1907 or 1902. Right. So they had to read what she had them doing at home, right? And then I had to write, had them write a reflection. Well, they had to send me pictures and how their auger worked and all of that. Okay, right. But a reflection on making media you know, over a hundred years ago and compared to today and interesting things they learn. It was funny that one student said, I've learned from reading the book, the home correspondence book, that I shouldn't leave my meat out on the counter. I'm like, uh -huh. Don't you, in this day and age, isn't that something you already know? Like, no, it's just weird. But so, but they like, they said they like that activity. So that was something. Yeah, that, uh, I mean, I've been talking about the lecture, but I know I teach labs. If I have to teach an online lab, and I, I wasn't here in the spring again, but obviously, you know, labs are a lot more challenging to give our students that kind of experience. But that's a great example, uh, digging down, and now you got 15 labs to cover. <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah. Okay. And so in the spring, you didn't have time. Supplies so they could do stuff at home too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I had them do was I had them pick a country that they would have liked to travel to. And I had them go to the WHO dashboard site. And over a two week period, they had to record the new cases of COVID every day right. and then graph it. And then, just, and then look up what the country's you know, um, pandemic restrictions were and decide whether they would go on their trip or not. Oh, that's cool. Good work. Yeah. <laughs> Good fun. work. Good work. Nobody was going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no one, one person said New Zealand, right? And they have yeah. like zero cases now. They were going to go to New Zealand because it's pretty safe. Yep, that's but true. That's so that's it, right? Nobody else I, was going anywhere else. No, I know. Well, good. Thanks for sharing that. that uh, that's inspiring to me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you could go to New Zealand now, Doug, and it'd be okay. You could finish your sabbatical. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we we'll just go with you. We have to teach remotely. I know. We could all have experiential learning. <laughs> That's maybe the benefit of all, all, totally online in the fall. We'd be right. out of business, but <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> this, uh, Jason, what this, about you? 
Well, this, yeah, this question was exactly what I was going to ask you when we got to the end of this lecture, which is sort of, you know, uh, uh, assuming we're, 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 we're not completely finished with um, remote instruction and, you know, and, and even, you know, beyond pandemic, um, you know, the idea of kind of turning some courses into online courses, like what does ex experiential learning look like in an online environment? And I know for, for me, um, you know, I, I struggled last semester with especially uh, anatomy dissection. You know, it was just oh, it's just gosh. one of those things where wow. when you're working with preserved specimens that that students can't have in their homes, um, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of like all you can do is deliver or all I was able to do on short notice was deliver um, you know, video dissections and and develop and and sort of handouts that I thought were were beefy enough to kind of communicate process and also the anatomy. Um, I, I I think that there there are sort of um, activities that I could imagine for my evolution course that would get students to uh, go outside in, in sort of a socially distanced way and look for examples of things that they could come back and report on. Um, you know, one of the one of the topics I teach in evolution is is uh, coevolution, and there's so many good examples of of coevolution. You know, looking at um, you know flowers and their pollinators, and and what aspects of the flower anatomy and pollinator anatomy um, you know must have evolved together in order to create this this intimate relationship between these two species. Um, but but it is a really difficult thing. I was talking recently to a friend of mine. Uh, who uh, this past spring semester at uh, Drexel uh, taught a, a course, it, it, 10 weeks of um, geological field techniques mm. online. Oh my God. You know? and, and it's like, that's just the kind of course which is, which is necessarily every week, you know, out in the field, learning technique, working with instrumentation, and 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 it's just how do you translate that into an ex, into an experience that a student can do sitting at home on their phone or on a computer? I, it, and you know, and he showed me some of the activities that they did, but it, you know, it's just it's just no real substitute. And I think you know one of the things that I I liked about and and it was a great presentation all the way through, Doug. I should have said at the start. Um, but one of the things that I I liked was um, especially was was this idea that you know these kinds of experiences, as you describe them, are more memorable. So it's it's not just a different kind of instruction, kind of delivering information in a different way. It really is about giving them something that's going to stick in their mind better. And and I also uh, like you and some of the the colleagues that you you speak with at at conferences. You know, I'm much more about teach them one thing that they're going to remember. Rat, you know, that is better than teaching them a million things, uh, a zero of which they'll remember. So, you know, it's and that's that's just kind of extreme case. But I'm always thinking about how do I how do I reduce but make more memorable? How do I how do I reduce the amount of content but deliver it in a way where it'll stick in their imagination? And and so. I think experiential types of um, uh, teaching really have that as as a major benefit, the the memorability of it. Yeah, that and I I learned that by fire. For example, we went on a field trip to the Eagles, right? Pretty good memorable experience. On the way home, we had a flat tire, right? At the they talked about the flat tire years <laughs> later. Like, Doc, remember when we had that flat tire? Like, okay, you don't remember. <laughs> But it created a good experience for them because we it was near one of the students had a landscape shop and was only up the street. So we went there and it was, you know, it was just a situation that they have strong memories in. And uh, but well, I didn't try to create that on purpose. But, uh, you know, those that's something that's difficult to measure. But I think uh, if you can try to do those, not get a flat tire, but um, try to do things like that, that will stick in their brain. It, they'll think good of Del Val and hopefully of the subject of you, and I guess that should be good for learning. That's my conclusion. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's sort of you know how how do you design uh, those kinds of things that students remember because of the spontaneity of it, right? I mean, yeah, like right. it's 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 the same kind of thing. Like 
you know, when you go on a vacation with a group of people, what you tend to talk about years later are things that happened on that trip that were not part of the itinerary, right? I mean, it, it's, it, it, it tends to be those spontaneous moments. So is there a way to um, kind of design experiences right. that, that, you know, that, that either feel spontaneous or have some spontaneity baked into them? Yeah, there is, and I'll give you an example. Uh, Joe Valentine, he teaches our soils lab and I've taught it with him. And he, we go on a field trip and we go up towards Quaker Town and we get off the bus, it's a, we take a bus uh, and all 20 students and we're on the 663, it's a busy highway, looking at a road cut like the rocks and the students don't remember the kind of rocks and what, but they always remember, hey, remember that we, we got out and he was using that crazy microphone and they remember that like, so right. I said, Joe, don't ever give that up because it's creating a memory at least. Um, and he's like, well, they're not, I don't know if they're remembering the stuff. Um, but oh, that's, a, that's an example where he purposely still does that to give them that same experience. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if, you, so if you stumble across something like that, just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So I know this example is a lot of work and a lot of people might want to do, not do it, but it does give the students a memorable experience tied to DelVal that they can take with them. So if you have the students do an 8A classroom display, Correct. right, and then I have them man the display and they really are uh, at first, but then they really like talking to the public Correct. and they can go enter for a ribbon, you know, if they, virology two years ago or a year and a half ago won first place, they were so excited. I have a picture in my office. I mean, everybody looks happy, right? And right. It is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. You have to take time out of lecture to organize and plan and get the students in groups. So you have to lead it. But they do get the experience of researching the topic outside of the class, coming up with the design, designing the posters, talk about as a group how you're going to lay out the display, set it up, man it, talk with the, the people you know that come through the displays. and. I think it's a great experience learning activity. And I have them write a reflection essay at the end. And they do awesome. get graded because they have benchmarks where they have to turn in, you know, what references are they going to do? They have to show their poster to the class for group discussion about it. Do they need to change anything? No, so there are it is a graded activity, but and but it is a lot of work on the part of taking away stuff from class, but I really think it's a great experience overall for them and a memorable experience, right? You know? Right. And, and it, you notice it, who they would meet coming through the classroom at A-Day, right? Right. And it, it gets activity for your area as well. It, right. it show, you know, DelVal and it helps DelVal. So that, that's a perfect example of getting multiple benefits from that. I wonder if you could, uh, to tempt the students like okay if you do the a day we'll we'll substitute uh five lectures for that meaning well you won't what have I to come in the time you put at a day weekend we'll substitute that in you don't have to come to lecture well what i did since we had the new uh, we were going to have an a day display this year but that can got canceled right but i um said they don't have to take the final exam so that would okay. be like yeah. the final exam because it really does a accumulate their inf knowledge about the subject they have to use to make that display and demonstrate orally to the public that they are knowledgeable in that area right right so, did, did um, you was that did you force everyone to do that or yes everyone has to participate in it oh wow i like and that so uh, depending on the people in the class so this was going to be for molecular biology so it's going to be a harder one but they were going to do the advent of um, DNA therapies. And so one group was assigned to like the background information. So the development of DNA sequencing, DNA sequencing techniques. I forget what the other groups, you know, ethical concerns, um, technologies. I, I forget what all the groups, we had like five groups, right? right. And so, um, but we didn't get to do it, so. But it, it is a lot of work. I'm, I, I, really, I really like doing it. I've gotten better at helping to organize it over the years. But I think it's a great experiential learning activity, you know? 
and they that's, were really happy when they won. <laughs> that's perfect. What what you, that's a perfect that's a classic experience that right. Um, in, so in, always remember and. and I've given the students the option, so we've done classroom displays, and I ask them, do you guys want to be judged or not? And some classes decide that they don't want to be judged, so I've had that happen too. Right, so right. I, I give them, like, they don't have to go through the judging process if they don't want to. So. Yeah, cool. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I agree with you on the time. Some of these things take, especially the first time around, huge time commitment. And then you're questioning, okay, I can't even measure learning. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, anyway. I, I, I think it's okay to measure learning in some kind of reflective essay, Doug. Yeah. Right? Yep. I mean, that's easy enough to do. Yep. Um, and by doing that, you also have a written response of whether they really liked the activity or you know whether they got something out of the activity because the way they talk about it. Right? Correct. Yep. I, I, I don't know. I think it's okay to have a reflective essay type thing. It doesn't yep. have to be long, but in one no. page, you know, right. no. five, yeah. five paragraphs or three paragraphs, right? You right. don't have to kill yourself reading through it. <laughs> no, I know that. I know that. No. But. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing that. Awesome. Anyone else? I guess that in thinking about, you know, I mean, even just the lab portion of a course and spinning it online, what I did in our spring portion was that I videoed myself doing some of the labs, um, which is nice in some way that I can actually see that the instrumentation is doing its job and not, because the, the students don't, don't always get great data and then you're like, hmm, is this instrument really out of calibration? The answer is it's not, it's the students, so that's nice to see. <laughs> but, um, you know, thinking about like the topic of spectrophotometry that I have to tackle in analytical one, I realize one of the things that I've started doing is I take an old UV vis spectrophotometer that doesn't operate anymore. And I've started taking the cover off of it and saying to the students, all right, get a screwdriver or here's the, the power drill even. Let's take out these screws. Let's look at the inside. Let's look at the guts of the thing and identify the parts of it. And so I was thinking to myself as, as you were going through the presentation and here at the end, well, how do I now do that same activity and build in more of the experiential learning than just looking at the parts, but also do it online. <laughs> and so what I, I, it just kind of clicked in my head that one of the things that I could do is you can actually buy pretty cheap photodiodes and pretty cheap detectors. And I almost wonder if I can make an at-home kit and send it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, Radio Shack would be an easy place to go, but that's you know not an option these days. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure I could find those little pieces and they could actually make their own right. operable instrument, which that's a good you know, idea. Honesty, is a huge benefit because there's a lot of people in the chemistry world that get their degree, they have an, an understanding of the instrumentation operation, but they can't troubleshoot. And so ideally, if you can make the instrument, hopefully you, then you have also built in some of that troubleshooting, at least the mindset um, thereof. So I, I'm kind of thinking to myself, I have some uh, research to do later this afternoon. <laughs> good work. That's <laughs> what the whole purpose of this is. Yeah, fine. good work. And just start out small. I mean, uh, and you can see Cynthia's project got pretty big pretty quick, but, uh, um, you know, start out small, see if you can, and, and yeah, good work. Yeah. I'm, so I don't, got me I, thinking, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great idea, Melissa. They might have, like kits or something already available to make something like that yeah like, i mean i've done certain things like that like in my own research especially on the graduate level um that i had to do that and right. so i know sometimes like the kits only get you so far right okay um, or you can there's sometimes some cost savings that come in right in buying the little bitty pieces and I think it's a great idea. I think the students would really like that, right? Yeah, I think fun to make something. I mean, 
it, it's it's kind of like a a different way of playing with Legos in a lot right. of right right there you go good work well we made microbial fuel cells one time and the students really like that and that's not really I guess that's something I could do have them do this fall right see if they can run their own little light bulb or something. right. Yep. right? with mud from around their neighborhood. Because you don't really need too much there. Mm -hmm. Some wire, some metal. Right. right. And a light bulb or a little thing somehow. Well, thanks for thanks for listening. And um, obviously, you could email me if you have any other comments or questions or um, anyway, it'd be great if we could be all together <laughs> face to face, but it is what it is, and we'll see you in a few few months, right? Hopefully, Maybe. hopefully, <laughs> yeah. With masks on, so, but uh, I think we're fortunate. It sounds like we're going to be open, and that's going to hopefully keep us in business for many years. Right, right. So, but yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Doug. This was sure. fun. I, yeah, I know I have some more work to do now. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Great. Take care. Bye. Sure. Melissa, I can't come.